Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Midtown Scholar Bookstore. My name is Alex. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening. We're happy you're here. We hope you feel safe and we hope you enjoy tonight's program as part of this weekend's uh, AAPI Heritage Month celebration. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, one, while our speakers will take their masks off this evening for the conversation, we please ask that you continue to keep your masks on throughout the program including the audience Q&A and book signing. Uh, two, this event is being live streamed on Zoom. So for those tuning in, please feel free to ask questions at any point via the Q&A box. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible after the conversation. And lastly, perhaps most importantly, please consider supporting the bookstore and our author this evening by purchasing a copy of Disorientation through the Midtown Scholar Bookstore. Every purchase helps support the author the bookstore and our ability to run these events as free and open to the public. But at this time, it is my honor to hand it over to Ellen Min. Ellen fearlessly spearheaded this weekend's festivities uh, for Harrisburg's first ever AAPI Heritage Month celebration. So please join me in giving her a warm round of applause. Good evening and welcome to Harrisburg's very first third in the Berg AAPI Heritage Month celebration. My name is Ellen Min and it's an honor to have you here in community with us um, at this wonderful bookstore and with our wonderful author. Um, in the state of Pennsylvania, there are over 600,000 AAPI persons and this community is one of the fastest growing communities um, in this state. And the lack of visibility of AAPI persons in media, leadership positions, and in school curricula is a large contributor, contributor to the recent 339% increase in anti-Asian hate crimes. I truly believe that programs and celebrations such as this one, where we join together in community, is a step in creating visibility, safety, and belonging for all. Thanks to an incredible group of volunteers, Alex Brubaker, uh, Lauren Chang, a high school student at Cumberland Valley High School, Richard Choi, Suzanne Itzko, Stuart Landon, Virginia Lucy, and Halston Merrily for our incredible, and also our incredible partners, the Broad Street Market, Midtown Scholar, and Midtown Cinema. We have a weekend of events uplifting and spotlighting just a few of the many AAPI communities in our region. And also because of the generosity of AAP, API Political Alliance, Central PA Korean Association, the Lucy family, and Lauren Chang's high school bake sale, uh, we were able to raise enough funds to make all of our events free and open to the public. So it's my honor to welcome and introduce our speakers this evening. Our interviewer this evening is Helene Lee. Helene's areas of interest are in immigration, ethnic identities, globalization and transnationalism. Her research focuses on returning migration projects back to the ancestral homeland, motivated by the search for home and a sense of belonging by members of the diaspora, particularly within the Korean context. She is currently at work on a book manuscript which explores how the economic, political and social lives of Korean Americans and Korean Chinese migrants are shaped by ideas of ethnic authenticity and hybridity in Seoul, South Korea. Our featured author this evening is Elaine Shea Chow. Elaine is a Taiwanese American writer from California, a 2017 Rona Jaffe Fund Foundation graduate fellow at NYU and a 2021 NYSCA, NYFA, Artist Fellow. Her short fiction appears in Black Warrior Review, Guernica, Tin House Online, and Plowshares. Disorientation is her first novel. Of course, Elaine's debut novel that we are here for this evening is titled Disorientation, called the funniest, most poignant novel of the year by Vogue. Disorientation is an electrifying debut, one that asks who gets to tell our stories, and how the story changes when we finally tell it ourselves. It is an honor to welcome Elaine Shea Chow to the bookstore for Harrisburg's first Third in the Berg AAPI Heritage Celebration. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm Harrisburg welcome to Elaine and Helene.
thanks for organizing and thank you for spending this what day is it saturday <laughs> your saturday night with me oh, see how messed up i am friday <laughs> night with you already and Celine, of course for being here with me all right um first off thank you elaine uh, for coming here today and many thanks to alex and the midtown scholar for hosting this event as part of the Harrisburg AAPI Heritage Month celebrations. And thank you for you all for making it here um, during, we're still in the pandemic and I know sometimes it's hard to leave the house. So it's really a pleasure to just be here in community with you all. I even found real pants to put on. So it's really a special evening. Um, Elaine, huge congratulations on the book and the praise that it's already um, garnered. Uh, and I know people say they don't, but absolutely everyone judges books by their cover, and this cover mm -hmm. is pretty fantastic. And the inside spine is even pink, so there you go. If that's not a plug to buy this book <laughs> immediately, there you go. All right, I'm really excited to have a conversation, um, and I have so many questions, so I'm going to let you oh. read first. Okay, thank you, Helene. So I'll do a, a short little reading. So um, all you need to know is that Ingrid Yang is a 29-year-old PhD student. She's Taiwanese American and her fiance is a white man named Stephen Green. She has just discovered a secret folder um, in his computer of, of his three Asian ex-girlfriends. Waiting at a stoplight, Ingrid was needled by the realization she was avoiding Stephen. She had never in all five years ignored his calls. But what was she supposed to say to him? Hello, dear, how's the weather over there? And do you even love me for who I am? On the one hand, her self-induced panic attack over his three Asian ex-girlfriends was ludicrous. Was it fair to bring charges against him for his past relationships? And was his offense, if it could even be called that, serious enough to warrant a breakup? After all, she loved Stephen. She counted on him tremendously. His actions and words had an overwhelming effect on her. Their lives and possessions and habits were inextricably enmeshed, and she felt an intense attachment to him, like she was a non-cancerous growth on his thigh. That was love, wasn't it? Ingrid was physically incapable of picturing the future without also picturing the future of Mr. and Mrs. Green. They would, get, uh, they would marry, get pre-approved for a mortgage, retire, grow old, die in their sleep, ideally at the exact same time. Like Judith Newman and her husband, they would constitute the quintessential academic couple a literary translator and a professor, their personalities, bookish, nitpicky, socially awkward, one and the same, quiet nights at home spent completing a 3D clown puzzle or enjoying a documentary on the behavior of feral cats. Theirs was a foolproof blueprint for happiness. Ingrid had coveted this future for the two of them, had waited impatiently for it. And now because of some old photos, she was willing to toss it all out the window. Eunice's words rang in her head. Are you insane? And yet she couldn't expel Alex's declaration from her head either. The sad thing is, Ingrid, you'll never know for sure. How could she know for sure? Like Eunice had explained, something as superficial as taste in food and pop culture was meaningless. This sort of man was becoming craftier. He knew better than to showcase his collection of samurai swords on his bedroom wall or advertise his encyclopedic knowledge of 1990s anime on the first date. Like all mammalian predators, he had adapted to his environment environment. This sort of man could be anywhere. Ingrid glared suspiciously at the white men passing by on the sidewalk. Should she put Stephen through a series of tests, attach him to a polygraph machine while thumbing through photos of women from every conceivable ethnicity, taking note of who made his heart rate quicken, make him sign a binding legal document prohibiting from dating another Asian woman, should they ever break up in order to save her the humiliation of being relegated to number four on the list. Persuade him to relocate to a country with so few Asians, the odds of him straying from her would be next to none. Poland? North Dakota? Because ever since the three Asian ex-girlfriends incident, Ingrid had begun eyeing her fellow Asian woman in an unsettling new way. Here was another one, traipsing down the street while listening to music on earbuds. Ingrid glowered at her, even bared her teeth a little. A month ago, she would have been an unremarkable pedestrian. Today, she was a direct threat to her impending marriage. All her life, Ingrid had dutifully held up white women as the embodiment of beauty, and it follows had compared herself to them, and it follows had come up short. But white woman's elevated position in her hierarchy of beauty had been unseated. After all, if Stephen had a, fe a 
F word for Asian women than every single one alive on the planet between the ages of 18 and say 62 must be irresistible to him since race was the defining pool of attraction. She didn't think individual attractiveness played a major role since Annie was dowdy and Jenny was plain and Sandra, Ingrid hated to admit, was more conventionally attractive than herself. But then what was the deciding factor between more than one Asian woman? Was the only way to avoid replacement by another Asian woman to somehow become the ultimate Asian woman? <laughs> Ingrid froze in the middle of the street. So why had Stephen chosen her? Because she happened to be in the right place at the right time? If he'd met another Asian woman five years ago with roughly her same age, ed education and prospects, would he have ended up with her? Would he be just as happy? I'll stop there, thank you. All right, um, thanks for starting off with that. Um, I'll just start off with a very basic question. So since I got this book, I've been excitedly telling people, oh my God, this book is so great. Um, but then I really struggle to kind of explain what kind of book it is. So I just say, oh, it's a satire, you know, set in academia. You know, Ingrid is the main character. She's an Asian American woman. She's in grad school. She's trying to finish her dissertation. And she kind of gets enmeshed in like racial and gender politics at her school. But then it switches into a mystery detective kind of uh, story. And then by the time I look up, like I've been talking for 10 minutes trying to describe what kind of book it is and their eyes are glazed over. And, you know, so I've been trying to sell it, but apparently I've been just like offering this very convoluted description. So I'm going to go straight to the source mm. is um, for a lot of these folks who haven't yet um, gotten their hands on it. How do you describe your book uh, to to folks uh, interested in mm, this is tricky because I've actually been having this conversation with people where we're like, is this a satire? <laughs> because um, some people, I won't say who on the internet have, have been like, oh, I find like this unbelievable, like a white person wouldn't really do this. And for example, like this one line where this white, per white man is like, Oh, Stephen is like, I, I know what discrimination is too, because I wore glasses in elementary school and I was bullied. So I also understand racism. Um, that line is pulled from an actual Facebook post where a white man did say that. <laughs> so I just, a lot, and a lot of readers have told me like this exact situation happened to me. Um, this exact line has been said in my face. So I'm like, I don't know if it's a sad, like so much of it is real. And at the end, it's not a spoiler to say I put like notes in the end that are my receipts to be like, if you want to <laughs> accuse me <laughs> of, you know, uh, not giving people the benefit of the doubt, just look at these receipts. Um, so is it a satire? I don't, I don't know. Okay. How to describe it. Right. Um, <laughs> I have a log line I came up with that's I was like, okay, if I have like a one sentence log line, it's what happens when a student who's clueless about race discovers the most racist secret at her school. So that I feel like kind of encompasses it and it's supposed to be uh, hopefully funny and um, like a huge part of it is also about Ingrid's relationship with this white man, Stephen, and her fear of being fetishized and what that feels like and sort of the psychological toll it takes on her. Um, so yeah, I feel like the book is, it's like, yeah, Ingrid's journey to get free uh, and, you know, discovering some white people shenanigans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so if that's not reality on a university campus, I don't know what it is. Um, all right. So I'm trying not to give away key plot points, but representation and questions around authenticity, who can speak for whom, right? Who has the authority to create knowledge about uh, what communities? Um, these are recurrent themes throughout the novel. And I wanted to ask more about um, this in terms of a scene that takes place at a forum held by um, the People of Color Caucus of the Post-Colonial Studies Graduate Department. And they're talking about like yellow face and the casting of a white actor for an Asian American character in a play written by a Chinese American playwright. Um, and I love how you write um, like the conservative far right and the sort of radical far left and everyone in between gets, you know, is the target of what I hope is satire, but maybe, uh, maybe others might read it the wrong way. 
Um, and so Ingrid, who's kind of clueless about everything, she kind of gets dropped into this culture war, you know, filled with like speaking truth to power and calls to check privilege um, and so on. Um, and when people are talking, they preface their comments while, well, speaking as a Chinese American man, and then it's followed by, well, speaking as a Chinese American woman, and then following that, well, speaking as a queer, disabled Chinese first generation child of immigrants. <laughs> And this made me laugh so hard because many of us have been in similar spaces where people are kind of jockeying for legitimacy and trying to be, you know, the most authentic voice of the oppressed. Um, but for Black, Indigenous, people of color, BIPOC folks, um, especially in academia, which remains predominantly white, both in representation and color, this is like a kind of a real struggle and pressure to perform race uh, in the quote unquote right way. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about how you approached writing this scene um, and creating characters who we can kind of poke fun at, right, for competing in kind of the woke Olympics, um, but also take seriously, right, the poli politics of representation and sort of the importance of marginalized communities to see themselves and produce their own narratives. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit as a, as a writer about that. Yeah, that that scene, it's just like, it's just dialogue. It's just, it's like pages of dialogue. And someone told me, oh, it reminds me of like a Twitter thread. And I was like, yes, that is definitely, I think what inspired me was as I was writing the book, like the bulk of it was 2016 to 2020. Um, so there was Twitter happening, of course, but also I was uh, in these Facebook groups where we were all Asian and we would like fight with each other. <laughs> So you would have like, there's a character called Vivian Bo, um, and she's like the most radical leftist um, activist. I love Vivian. I feel like it's not always very clear, but I love it. <laughs> and, um, and then you have also a character like Timothy Liu, who is very conservative and wants to abolish affirmative action and is just like a sort of staunch Republican. And so being in these groups, I think I was really fascinated by how divided we are as a community, you know, community. I think sometimes, especially right now, like during API month, we tend to think of, and obviously there is solidarity and there is a lot of coming together, but there has been a lot of division where like, for example, in my family, some people voted for Trump and I was literally in the streets protesting him. And you know, how do we reconcile that? Um, I feel like when we talk about Asian American identity, we have to look at the ugly parts, which is that in recent years, politicians like Sari Kim, um, Elaine Chow, uh, you know, married to the devil, Mitch McConnell, <laughs> like unfortunately has my name. Yeah, when you used to Google me, she would pop up and that's literally why I had to add my middle name. <laughs> um, but like, we have to talk about them. Right. I think it's it's hard to, but uh, they're there and they're also Asian. Um, and so writing scenes like that, I wanted to look at what makes us messy and complicated. Um, and and we do argue with each other. We don't always agree or get along. And in these Facebook groups, you know, people would get scolded like the Vivians on there would be like, and add like a moderator and be like, you, you have to do self crit for 24 hours. You can't post anything like these groups. Some of these groups are strict, <laughs> but um, yeah. So a lot of just being online, honestly, and observing, you know, I was just like, okay, okay. Like taking it all in. Um, and that's what I wanted to sort of evoke. Were you a participant in some of these uh, discussions or were you generally? Yeah. I remember one time I got scolded and I was like, oh God. Just, like something that I had to confront was East Asian privilege. And I would, I just kept thinking of Asian identity as East Asian identity. And I was scolded by a South Asian person being like, you need to stop thinking that fetishization only affects like light skinned East Asian people. It affects us too. And I was like, oh my God, you're right. I need to be self create I need to like look into <laughs> And then as the years went on, I feel like I would, I would then try to scold people <laughs> like I would. To, so I think me writing someone like Vivian is having distance from that now that like when I, you know, was trying to be a Vivian, but not very good at being that and realizing like, you know, I would rather call people in than shut them out 
because when you shut them out, they literally go on like an MR Asian Reddit forum and then start reading outright ideology, <laughs> you know? So I'm like, I would rather us not do that. <laughs> and instead like, stay with us. Don't let's, let's like talk. Let's, you know, let's go to therapy, but don't, yeah. Like go on those forms. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're a writer searching for material. Yeah. For <laughs> um, well, speaking as a second generation Asian American woman, you see what I did there. Um, <laughs> I grew up in the 1980s watching an obscene amount of television and reading voraciously. And I never saw Asian Americans at all on the screen or in books. And I sadly never even expected to. Um, but I feel like things have turned. And we talked a little bit about this with Ellen downstairs that um, it, it feels like we're more visible. We have our heritage month, you know, like, you know, you and I are on the stage talking about uh, these things. Progress. Um, so in the book, we meet three Asian American women, uh, Ingrid Yang, uh, her sort of nemesis turned ally turned something, right? Uh, Vietnamese, Vietnamese American Vivian Vo, and then her BFF Korean American Eunice Kim. And I feel like I have been uh, each of these three women at some point in my life. And I appreciated seeing work where there was more than one of us at the same time, right? And we weren't just the plucky sidekick. And that Asian American women weren't all the same, right? That there were these tensions at times, you know, they're butting heads or, you know, perceiving each other as the enemy, right? Mm -hmm. They're turning against each other. Um, and through these three women, you engage with like topics like the toxicity of graduate school, especially for BIPOC folks. Uh, thank you for my PTSD flashbacks <laughs> to my own time. Uh, tensions around white men, Asian women pairings, that sort of fetishism and you know, sort of yellow fever, and also the way that politics can create these divisions you were talking about within Asian America, right, um, especially around the model minority image and affirmative action policies. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you created these characters, like how you envision and sort of solidified around these three Asian American women mm -hmm. as, you know, a certain kind of, uh, of capturing a certain kind of Asian American woman experience, and then your intent behind their development, because they sort of change over the course of the book. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and if they were influenced at all by your own experiences, either when you were in grad school or as a writer, just like real life, right? In these forums and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, the trifecta of Asian woman, I've heard this called that, and I, which I love. Um, so Ingrid's character, she was, there were three versions of the novel and uh, Ingrid's character was always there. She was the protagonist and her story was always central, but these other characters took me a while to figure out. And I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, Ingrid's journey and the sort of people she needed to meet and butt up against. So it was in the second version where there was a character I created named Jeremy Nguyen, who was like an early version of Vivian, where he's um, an activist on campus and she's very intimidated by him and he's also really hot and she's like confused <laughs> like he he like thinks she's ridiculous and but she's very like ruffled every time she's near him and you know doesn't really understand why so so he be, sort of became Alex too later in in this version um, so I think that was how Vivian's character first started is is just this polar opposite of Ingrid. And, you know, she she plays it safe, right? She's sort of the model minority. And I, I, it, I knew it was so important for her to meet someone who would make her sort of for, force herself to look in the mirror and uh, confront things she doesn't want to confront. And then with Eunice, she didn't... Uh, you know, appear until the third version where I realized Ingrid was going through all of this alone. So she sort of not only is like sleuthing and breaking in alone, which I feel like is hard. <laughs> Generally, you need to maybe plan with someone <laughs> and like have a lookout, have a getaway car, you know, things like that. Like you, you kind of need someone there. But also she was all her struggles, everything she was navigating, um, she was going through alone. And I was like, why doesn't Ingrid have any friends? <laughs> <laughs> which was like a huge oversight on my part. But then when I started reading certain books, I realized this is actually a thing. Like you'll read a book 
that's like you know it's got the main character and they, and they don't really have any friends so I was like Ingrid needs a friend and Eunice um is like everyone's favorite character I can't imagine the book I can't imagine Ingrid without her they like belong to, with each other they are soulmates I believe <laughs> and um yeah so it was a lot of trial and error and in terms of are they based on so no one's none of them are based on any real people but um I think what was an inspiration to me was like in a lot of Asian American books I was reading, it tended to be like all the characters would be Chinese American or they'd all be Vietnamese American or they'd all be Korean American. And you wouldn't see a lot of mixed friend groups. It was actually Don Lee, like Yellow and The Collective that the first time I read these books where we, we are just hanging out together. And I was like, I want to write something like that because that's true to my life you know um like in college I went to UC Irvine which is 60 percent Asian and it was like a revelation because I had even though I'd grown up in California all the towns I lived in like there just weren't a lot of Asians um so arriving at UC I was like oh my god like every type of Asian like you had the most like punk rock you know like two inch plugs in his ears Asian you had um you know, this guy, like, every, I don't know, every sort of type of person you can imagine, they, they were Asian too. Like, you know, when you tend to grow up, like, in a very small, like, you know, you don't have as much variety. And so it was important to me to show that th this is real life. Like, you know, we we don't segregate amongst ourselves. And like you said, we, we are not a monolith. And we're all, yeah, we come with different sorts of baggage, different backgrounds. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about Ingrid um, and the idea of disorientation, because I feel like throughout the course of the book, she, her world just keeps flipping around and she has to rethink who she is and mm. her relationships and all that. Um, but at times I was so frustrated by her. I'd be like, girl, why haven't you thought about this? You know, like in the passage you read, it's like, this is the first time you're thinking about, you know, like fetishism and, you know, your white, white fiance who is a translator in Japanese, even though he's never, you know, he's self-taught Japanese. Like, it just like, it was so frustrating to be like, how could you be so naive, you know? But then you do this great thing where in like these casual asides in the narrative, you kind of hint at or talk about abuse in her, her previous relationships. And then when we see like the trauma and like, I would say like coercive and kind of a form of violence that she has with her academic advisor, Michael, and then her fiance, Stephen. It's like, you give us this depth to her character, um, but then at the same time, she's kind of naive and so eager to please, you yeah. know, and sacrificing herself, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of losing herself. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more, more about like what it was like to write and kind of develop her as a character. Um, and, you know, and without giving away too much in the way of spoilers, like, did you always know where Ingrid was going to end up, like what her progression would be? Or was it something that kind of surprised you as you were writing? Yes. Yeah, I uh, I'll answer the second part first. Yes. Yeah, so I always knew by the end she has to break free. She has to take agency. She's someone who's been stepped on her whole life. And I think what I wanted to explore with her character was how does it feel to move through the world when so much of how you act you realize was dictated by expectation so i think ingrid inside naturally has a lot of rage um and i think she has charm i think she's funny like i think she has these qualities you know good qualities inside her but because she is a uh, you know small East Asian woman, she's read as obedient and non-threatening and submissive. And so she begins to live her life that way. And so I think that's what interested me about her character is how do external forces end up being, like when they're so overwhelming, you start to believe what the world tells you about yourself, right? You're like, there's a moment where she says, you know, she's told this is all you can ever be. And she's like, yeah, you know, you don't question it, I guess, when it's so uh, heaped on you. And um, developing her character, I wanted her character to be contradictory. And in the the very first version, it's 
I knew it would begin with like this relationship she has to white men where she um, would exclusively date them and she felt an attraction to them, but then she begins to feel really disgusted by this attraction. So I wanted that contradiction there. And yeah, she is super frustrating. So a lot of people have told me like, they, you wanna like shake her by the shoulders. And a lot of that is, well, you know, let's be honest for comedic effect. Like <laughs> Some of it was just really funny to write that way. <laughs> but um, it is heartening to hear like a lot of Asian women have written to me and be, been like, you know, I related her to her so much in a way that I really didn't want to. Like, I really wanted to just be like, I would never do, I would never think what you think. I would never act like you. And, but then they would tell me like, you know, they, they would feel this um, uh, disappointment in her because it was like, they wished they hadn't also thought or, you know, behave like her. And I was like, I appreciate this honesty. That's real. <laughs> and um, I think for a lot of Asian Americans that we had to, I feel like we've we've had recent awakenings, you know, like I feel not that there weren't activists around, for, they've been around since the 60s. And there is a really strong history of Asian American activism. But I do feel like, you know, Ferguson, Peter Ling, uh, murdering a Kai Gurley, these were really hard moments in American history that we had to really look at ourselves and think about race, I think, in a way where we felt implicated you know, that we couldn't just be like the the bystander on the side. It was like, we we are involved. We had it. And then we had to talk about, you know, Rodney King and the LA riots and that like the anniversary recently came up and we had to talk about it again. <laughs> and it's like, um, I keep getting off track. But anyways, I feel I can't. What was the Ingrid? Right. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, we're messy. I wanted to write about that messiness. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying about like kind of reckoning about Asian America within larger racial politics and even anti-Black, um, anti-Latinx kind of tensions within our own communities as well as within Asian America itself, all the ethnic diversity and religious diversity and all that. Um, I feel like sometimes I can understand Ingrid because I don't know about yourself, like did you grow up like learning about and kind of like thinking about these issues in a critical way? Or I think for myself, it was like, you know, I didn't see myself as like a legitimate like form of, uh, you know, something we could study and talk about. Um, and when I teach in co at, at the college level, a lot of students are just like, what, you know, um, was that the same for you? Or um, was that part of like researching the book or you were already sort of politicized in those ways and then you brought that into how you shape the narrative and the characters? No, I was very much like similar to you where um, I didn't literally had no conception or understanding of Asian American history at all. It was not taught to me in school at all. I just remember 10th grade English class. This was all I got was we read the Joy Luck Club and that ended up traumatizing me because I was the only Asian student in that class. And the teacher kept, Miss, Mrs. Ross, why did you do this to me? She kept like stopping to be like, Elaine, did this happen? To you? Like she would just like wait for me to confirm things and everyone would stare at me. And you know, when you're 15, you don't want anyone to look at you, right? You're just like, oh my God, I am exactly the same as my classmates. I am not different. Why are you, they're gonna notice I'm Asian if you keep looking at me and asking me these questions. If you don't say anything, maybe no one will notice, <laughs> which is absurd, but that was, that was literally all I got. And I remember feeling, I, I think in that moment, I rejected Asian American literature and I didn't wanna read any more because of that experience where I was like, I don't relate to this at all. Like I'm growing up in Southern California where we like, like, like it's so different from 1980 San Francisco Chinatown, like, and also that book, a lot of it is set in China in the past. So I was just like, I can't relate to this at all. I guess I don't like Asian American literature. I don't know. I think I had to work out a lot of things, but no, to me, it was a very gradual learning and unlearning and I didn't realize so many, like I felt like a veil had been lifted for me um, when Ferguson happened in 2014 
And I was meeting activists for the first time and we were organizing together for Mike Brown and Eric Garner. And I, you know, like when Ingrid infiltrates the POC caucus, I was like that where I was, I just felt lost. I didn't know so much of the language. I didn't, I hadn't read, you know, Audre Lorde and Angela Davis. And I just felt like I had so much to catch up on. I felt very humbled to be let in that space to be trusted. And so it was a lot of me learning to like, yeah, be silent <laughs> and and think and learn and unlearn. Um, but that was when I everything changed for me, I think. And, and I started to read and learn about my own history, Asian American history, and um, this long fight that has been going on in this country. Yeah. Um... I was wondering if you could talk about, I mean, in addition to representation and sort of Asian and American identities and kind of engaging with the messiness of that, and this idea of like cultural appropriation and performance and white privilege also comes up a lot, especially uh, with the two char white characters, um, Michael um, and Stephen, right? Um, in the ways uh, whiteness kind of, there are their reckoning with their whiteness never really happens, right? Um, but the cultural appropriation, I mean, I think a lot of us, we went through this with the Rachel Dolezal um, controversy um, in like 2015 um, of a white woman who gets outed, um, but she unproblematically presented herself as a black woman, right? Um, and she was the president of the NAACP chapter in Spokane, Washington, and as an activist. And in academia, there's rife, you know, it's rife with these kinds of stories of like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. you are not an indigenous scholar, right? Mm -hmm. Or you're not X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. um, and so like in your book, you kind of juxtapose like, you know, Ingrid, who's like constantly struggling with imposter syndrome, right? Is like, she doesn't, eat, she doesn't know who she can represent and whether she's ever going to be good enough, no matter what her accomplishments are, you know, and all her credentials, like, she just never feels qualified or like worthy to kind of be in grad school, finish that damn dissertation, right? And get the PhD. Um, and I think as BIPOC, BIPOC folks, we often struggle with that, you know, in real life. Um, but on the flip side, we have these like white men who have no problems kind of co-opting or cultural appropriation, creating knowledge about um, cultures that are not theirs, right? And when they're called out on it, they just lean harder into, <laughs> right? Their whiteness. Um, and even with the Chinese American poet, Zhao Wen Chu, Chao, Chao, Chao um, kind of plays with this, right? Um, so I was wondering, like, what critiques are you trying to make through this uh, fictional setting of Barnes University around cultural appropriation and kind of juxtaposing these BIPOC characters with these white characters who are always failing up, right? Whereas the, the BIPOC characters are really like struggling, right, to justify yeah. who they are. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. That's such a great observation about how Ingrid has imposter syndrome versus like this unwarranted confidence of all these white men around her. I hadn't even thought of that. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'll steal that. I'll pretend I knew that all along. But um, I think I wrote this with a lot of rage when I started writing it. I was, I was just so sick of these narratives about my life that I had no say in, no control in. And I was just having this conversation the other day that like when I was born into the world, um, I slowly realized like, oh, okay, in this world, Asian women are have been hypersexualized, have been objectified, have been deemed, you know, as mere sex objects and right, all these stereotypes um, and myths about us. And it, I didn't consent to any of it. None of us did, right? This shit was written like a hundred years ago. Like Matt, you know, what is it? Madam Chrysanthemum, which was turned into Madam Butterfly, which is now Miss Saigon on Broadway. Like these stories and myths about Asian women and also intertwined with Asian men, right? Their emasculation are so old. And yet every generation of Asian person that's born into it, we're just like, wait, what? I didn't consent. Why is this the prevailing narrative about me? To the point where like, I, I know someone who was in a writing workshop who wrote like a really feisty Korean American woman. 
And a white man in her workshop was like, this character is unbelievable because Asian women don't act like this in real life. I've never met an Asian woman like this. And I was just like flames from the top of my head um, because, it, you know, I think it's just, you feel so powerless, right? And, and I wanted to write against these narratives. I wanted to write against the, you know, whoever, I can't even remember his name who wrote Madam Butterfly, but I wanted to write against, um, you know, Stanley Kubrick and uh, Full Metal Jacket. Lines of that, this dialogue that is now how many years, 50 years old, haunt Asian women. We've all heard it. I'm not, I refuse, you know, I'm not gonna even repeat it, but we all know it, it haunts us. And it's 50 years old. So I wanted to write against that. I wanted to write against even more recent um, depictions of us where it's just, again, so much anger and frustration that why is my life literally dictated? Because I've been put in terrible positions, horrifying positions, because people think I'm weak. People think I'm submissive. And again, it's this rage of like, I did not consent. And so <laughs> I, when I wrote this, I was writing like, you know, you've written about me and you've, you've, I've literally been forced to study your racist bullshit in class. Like I was forced to read The Quiet American in which Asian people are actual trash in that book. Um, but it was held up as like great American literature. And I was like, it's my turn. <laughs> I'm going to, like the Graham Greens and the Stanley Kubrick and whatever, all of you guys, I'm going to make fun of you and portray you as you really are. And you're not gonna like it. And 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 how do you like it now? You know, <laughs> like I I believe in revenge as justice and accountability. I'm rebranding revenge. It's not as like not a bad thing. It's have you heard of you know reparation? So <laughs> I that's yeah. I I think why I I approach those characters like with very strong intent to to try and undo damage that's been done to me. Yeah, I got the uh, signal. So um, my last <laughs> question was just um, to ask you as a writer, one last question um, is, do you feel like as a Asian American, Taiwanese American writer who, write, who wrote this awesome book, um, but also features Asian Americans, do you feel like that pigeonholing happens on the opposite end in your, your life as a writer where this is like, oh, of course an Asian American writer is gonna write about Asian American characters or like, pitched as, oh, this is like an ethnic writer writing about this experience? Or do you feel like creative writing is not like sort of beholden to those kinds of constraints? Um, I don't know. I, I think it's tricky. I think what I'm noticing these days is there's a lot that is not publicly said mm -hmm. and people won't touch it. So like, are we being recorded tonight? We are. Damn it. Well, well, we could talk about it. Because <laughs> there are a few Asian American authors who do not write Asian American characters and which is their right. I have never really seen in any sort of official publication, um, you know, like the, the typical ones you might think of like New York Times or whatever, being like this Asian writer doesn't have any Asian characters. How dare they? <laughs> Yeah, because I think that that's like a dangerous as assumption to be like you're if you're Asian, you must write about Asian characters. Um, but I think amongst I with my Asian writer friends, we privately will be like, I wonder why, <laughs> you, you know, just like what is what is going on there? What is beneath that? Because in undergrad, uh, when I took my first creative writing classes, I only wrote poor white characters who lived in like rural America that I had never visited or been to um, purely because I was trying to mimic the authors we were taught with we were you know like Raymond Carver, Flannery O'Connor these sort of held up as you know great short story writers and so I was like well I want to write a great short story you know I guess my, I'll write about two wheat farmers in North Dakota. I literally wrote that and my and my teacher loved it. Of course. She ate it up. So <laughs> but but someone after class, a white guy came up to me after class and he asked me, "How did you think of that?" And I remember, you know, at age whatever 20, I was like very prickly. I was very like 
what? Like, why can't I write it? Like, what? Am I only supposed to write the Joy Luck Club? You know, so I was still traumatized by the Joy Luck Club. So I think also that played into it. Like, I, I was very defensive about like, I, I'm going to write what I want. Um, but anyways, I feel like now publishing is very much they've been scolded in recent years and the statistics have come out about how white publishing is. So I feel like they're a little like, uh. <laughs> so even though amongst ourselves, we might, you know, speculate and, and talk about these, but I feel like in public, no one, everyone's afraid to make any kind of comment about like, oh, your identity should match what you're writing. Like they just know they would immediately be quote unquote canceled. So that's my impression of sort of where the conversation is right now. Interesting. Thank you so much for answering all this barrage of questions that I have, but I wanted to open it up uh, to the Q&A from public. Yeah, so we are gonna do Q&A, but before we do that, can we get a round of applause for both of the incredible individuals on the stage? Uh, so yeah, if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'm very short though, so you might need to raise it a little high. <laughs> but can you uh, speak about the um, the background and context of it? At, at which point that you feel you felt st strongly enough about that topic to write about it? It was what was happening at in your life at the time or the history at the time. That made you, you know, that that you spoke about anger. Mm -hmm. um, I know you went to you, you, UCI, so it's a very diverse school in the communities as well. So was, was that that plant the seeds in your head, or at which point in your life that you felt that this was need to come out at, at this time? Mm, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, it I started plotting the novel in like 2015, no, 2016, really. Um, because I had quit my PhD program. And I think that I, I had this sort of like life crisis moment where I quit and, you know, was like, what am I going to do with my life? And, you know, I went back to this love that I always had that was creative writing. And I think the thing is, I didn't write any fiction for seven years. And I think when I started writing, it was because I finally had something to say. Um, you know, I think I didn't feel that compulsion really before then because I hadn't had all this buildup. But one of the tipping um, points was in 2015, a white poet named Michael Derrick Hudson couldn't get his poem published. And um, instead of doing what all writers do, which is like deal with your rejection, workshop something, send it to your friends, whatever, he changed his name to Yi Fen Chow and got it published in a diversity issue of a journal that was only for POC poets. Um, and then sort of quickly outed himself to be like, you see the system is rigged against us and I just proved it. I mean, he just proved he's a horrible person, but um, yeah, I think a lot of Asian Americans were really pissed off that our identity was being used in this way that, you know, that our suffering is somehow seen as like, you know, like I, I'll skip the suffering. I'll just take what I think is like a benefit to being Asian at this moment or, you know, so I think that moment, yeah, really galvanized me. Um, everyone should check out Jenny Zhang's article on Buzzfeed. They pretend to be us while pretending we don't exist. That radicalized me in a lot of ways reading it. I was like, yes, yes, that is just like, furiously nodding, you know, with every, where she was articulating all this rage I had. Um, yeah, so I think that that was like a turning point. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I love how you've talked about your rage. I even, I have a framed photo of the word rage that was created um, by a BIPOC artist because I, it's just, I want my kids to see it. Like I, I think our rage can be very beautiful. Um, so obviously you process some of that rage and you have put it into your book, but just curious about what else you do to process that rage and what that looks like in your life personally and also just in your career. 
Mm, that's a great question. Yeah, because I, I can tell that it's rooted in care for each other in our community. Um, ah, <laughs> I think in a lot of ways, unfortunately, writing, like once the book, you know, I started, had to work on it, revise it, do the whole publicity gamut and all of that was so time consuming. And so it sucks up so much of your emotional bandwidth, mental bandwidth that in a totally non-healthy way, I would sort of store it away. And like, for example, with this spike in Asian hate crimes that is, has been so debilitating, you know, there's some days where like, I just cry. <laughs> Um, and the Atlanta anniversaries was definitely like a very hard moment. And then um, Christina Unilee's murder in New York, where she was like friends with friends, like it was so close, you know. Um, but then to be able to get up the next day, I just had to compartmentalize it. I don't, I don't want to recommend this. I feel like every <laughs> therapist, it, you know, will be like, don't repress <laughs> your sadness or emotions or rage but I didn't know what else to like I literally just was like and I have an event tomorrow <laughs> you know you know I just had to find a way to be like I will somehow deal with this later I will or sometimes I couldn't even look at it you know like I had to stop reading the news um for my own sake to to sort of protect myself so yeah I don't want anyone listening to be like, I'll, I should do what Elaine does. Don't do what I do. But that's, I think, how I coped during this really weird moment of like coming out with a book as um, we're being like killed and harassed and spit on. And yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you again for being here. And thanks to Helene for facilitating this wonderful conversation. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you view um, the field of Asian American literature, even just from the perspective of looking at your acknowledgments um, and who's blurbed your, your book, right? Um, the Asian American writers in your circle that have been formative for you, inspirational to you, um, and that are a part of a kind of creative and communal circle um, for, your, for your intellectual development, for your creative development. Um, we just love to get your perspective on on what that looks like and feels like for your process and development as a writer. Yeah, it was a lot of thank you for that. A lot of um, having to dig it up myself because yeah, in school I didn't really, you know, learn any of this, and I would honestly use things like Goodreads, where it'd be like, if you like this book, you should check out these books. So I would be like, you know, I'd find like one book I liked, like. Don Lee's Yellow, which I feel was very formative for me um, because he wrote, I felt like that was a book where I didn't feel the white gaze. He's so unapologetic with like, he explores really tricky stuff. Like um, he's writing about, you know, Asian men being with white women and fear of being fetishized. And he was doing this like in the, what was it like the nineties or early 2000s, you know, it's been a while. And um and he writes it like one of his stories or I feel like he digs into something that's so taboo, but that is so like present. Also, it's this story where um, a family, the dad is white and the mom is Japanese and they take their children on a trip to Japan. And the dad has this really creepy sort of relationship with his, you know, half Asian daughter. Um, and the daughter is like, Asian boyfriend is there sort of witnessing this really sort of troubling dynamic they have. And anyways, I just felt like a story like that was like incredible for me to read where I was like, you know, he doesn't care who he's making uncomfortable. This is, he's writing something that is just real and that he's witnessed. Um, so that, so him for sure. Uh, I love Marilyn Chin. She's a poet, but she also wrote this uh, amazing book, Revenge of the Mooncake Vixen, which is about two um, Chinese American twins who are just super horny and uh, getting into all sorts of trouble. And that book also is like a little magical realism. Like one of them wishes for round eyes one day. And so she just wakes up with them. And 
Um, there's it, yeah. So that book is like just wacky and fun where I, I feel like sometimes Asian American literature, you can think like, it's just a lot of immigrant family sagas that are like really depressing. And like, this book is just very fun. And the girls are just like horny and wacky. And um, I would also say, I love Jenny Zhang. Uh, I, I mentioned her before, but I hope I don't like seem creepy to her. If she ever hears me talk about her, she'll be like, she's obsessed with me. But <laughs> I loved anything in that she, when I read her work um, and could, she was writing a lot of nonfiction too, I love that she was just, yeah, blowing up this model minority stereotype and talking about these really dark, ugly feelings of, um, you know, feeling lust, feeling disgust, fe being uh, just, just breaking the rules and I don't know, just writing about the body, like in this way that I hadn't seen before. And so I think she was a big inspiration to me to be like, you know, we can be as messy on the page as we want as, as we are in real life. Um, so I think she was like that. Yeah, that was like a big game changer too. Okay. We have time for one more. Hello, um, thank you for coming. Um, and um, it's not really a question, but more so a comment. Um, like what you were saying about how um, you don't realize like you're racialized as an Asian person. So I was, I grew up very racially isolated um, from my community. And so for me, like, especially during like 2020 when like, um, you know, the big event happened, as everybody knows, um, just coming into yourself and finding and, you know, finding that rage that you talk about. Um, and, and for you, it's like writing it in a book. Like, for me, it's becoming like more politically active. And I, I think, um, so for me, like, I'm a transracial adoptee. So it's my mother, she's white. So, um, <laughs> but um, I've never, I don't always, I never really related to those ideas of being the model minority or being perfect. Like that was not my experience. And to be honest, for me personally, um, and I know for many other adoptees, our experiences don't always, often will get ignored by the Asian community within itself. And that itself, you know, is very isolating. And, um, but you know, through online during quarantine, I was able to find community, um, which, you know, helped me process emotions that I'm, you know, like rage and, you know, just looking at yourself in the mirror, like you talk about in your book, like, but mm -hmm. regarding your book. And um, thank you for sharing your experiences. Thank you. Thank you. That's really vulnerable to open up like that. Um, and yeah, I have some friends who are adoptees too. And I feel like we're, I, I, I'm seeing so much discourse about just that erasure and how a lot of adoption stories are not written by actual adoptees. And I feel like in fiction, you know, writers will use it as like a cool plot point, just like this will create drama or, or whatever without researching, um, like what it means and treating it with the care and precision I think it requires. So, um, you know, I was seeing, like, I really love writers like Matthew Slacy's, Nicole Chung, they're two really prominent adoptees in the writing world. And I feel like, yeah, they're very vocal about these stories should be written by us. And I'm just like, yes, please, like it's high time. I'm over here cheering you on and hoping more of the stories come out because yeah there's there's so much there that I think we just don't give enough time and space to you know that it deserves and yeah that it gets really erased in in by like Asian American mainstream whatever discourse um but yeah thank you for sharing that and I hope stories like yours that we hear more of them and that they're uplifted and, you know, not used as just like a plot point or something. 
Can we give one last round of applause for Elaine and Helene? Thank you, guys. A uh, couple quick notes. We're going to have a book signing over at this table. We have books available for purchase if you haven't had yours yet up at the cafe counter. So please grab your copy and get it signed uh, before you head out. And uh, lastly, we've got a few more events coming up for AAPI Heritage Month celebration. Um, so can we just give one last round of applause for Ellen and everyone who put this all together? And have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Oh, my God.